Hello, and welcome to Fire Subscriptions Connectathon Track. Uh, this is for Connectathon 29 here in January of 2022. Uh, my name is Gino Canessa, and I will be your host for this track of this Connectathon. Um, this video, we're just going to cover kind of an overview of what we're doing at Connectathon, what the uh, Fire Subscriptions are, how to use them, all those kinds of things. Uh, and then we'll have some subsequent videos and uh, pointers to a couple from the last Connectathon that didn't need updating. So with that, let's jump right in. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is uh, Fire Subscriptions for January 22. Uh, this track is being, uh, we're kind of hosting on behalf of HL7 Fire and the Argonaut Project, one of the accelerators. We've been very involved in the subscriptions work. Uh, and then uh, this is just aka.ms slash fire subscriptions. Uh, you can find this deck and others. Uh, there's a lot of links in here. So I'm trying to copy them down and everything else, and I will put the link in the description below as well, uh, so that that's all available. So, uh, the really quick uh, about me, I'm an engineer at Microsoft. I work in the healthcare standards and interoperability group uh, out of Microsoft Research, actually. Uh, we're here in beautiful, sunny but cold Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I've been working on Fire since 2019. Uh, a lot of infrastructure, tooling, code generation, things like that, and fire subscriptions. Been one of my uh, most intensive projects uh, since then. Uh, prior to fire work, I was doing DICOM work. Uh, apologize for all the CDs. Um, they were a great idea at the time. So, uh, But regardless, uh, you can contact me. There's my email address. Uh, I'm on Zulip pretty much all the time. Uh, and then where this video is hosted, YouTube, uh, I do have uh, try to post educational content there as well. So when we want to talk about subscriptions, we want to start by talking about uh, how Fire works first, because this is an infrastructure to, uh, piece for that. Um, and really, when we talk about Fire, the main thing we're talking about is rest. Fire is very restful. Uh, that's the main way of interacting with it, is through a restful interface. Uh, and rest is represent uh, representational state transfer, uh, if you're not familiar. Uh, but basically, it's pretty similar to the standard HTTP model. Uh, you know, you have all the different uh, get, put, things like that, that map pretty closely to get, read, uh, put, uh, create, post, update, things like that, patch. Uh, so it's pretty close, not exact, uh, but it's all client-driven uh, interactions. And uh, it's stateless, it's cacheable, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, great for uh, a general model, but uh, it does have some challenges, uh, particularly when we consider things like HL7 v2 that a lot of people are coming from, uh, that it was a very different paradigm. It was a very server-driven, messaging-based protocol. So, there we go. Uh, one of those things that comes out is the polling problem that REST has, uh, and that is when a client wants to know about something, uh, there's really not much of a choice other than saying, Ask the server, ask the server, ask the server. And that's because with the server being stateless and cacheless and all these different things, or cacheable, all these things, all it can do is just keep making the request, asking for new data. Um, this is a problem. It's expensive for the clients, it's expensive for the servers. Uh, some of these queries can be very complex and large. Uh, and it's just kind of a little gap in RESTful style protocols. And so what we really want is we want to be able to tell the server or ask the server to tell a client when something happens. Um, and that's it. We're done. Um, for anyone who's done uh, any sort of uh, interaction with software, uh, we all know that if it's this easy to describe, uh, then it's going to be very challenging to implement. Uh, so uh, I like to include this here uh, because luckily for us at least, this was identified very early on, so back in DS2.2, which in computer terms is uh, ancient history. Uh, but subscriptions were added all the way back then. During that time, there were some split-off projects, and again, I like to mention these in case they're more relevant uh, to people who are coming to this. Uh, so the first one here is Firecast, uh, and that one is more concerned with real-time context updates. Uh, so the kind of perennial example for Firecast is uh, a radiologist who has an EMR, a transcription service, and a DICOM viewer open. 
uh, and you need some way of synchronizing when I go to a new patient across all those different apps. So it needs to be very real time. I don't want to start dictating and have it be on the wrong patient. Um, and it's um, context. It's I'm changing patients, I'm changing studies, things like that. It's often between different applications. It's often on the same computer. Um, but uh, as always, uh, they're pushing the boundaries. Good stuff. They're working on a new release. Um, there will be a virtual Connectathon post with this Connectathon. Uh, another project is CDS hooks, clinical decision support hooks, uh, and that is more concerned with things that are happening in a workflow, and it's a closed loop. So uh, one of the good examples for that is uh, something called uh, PAMA, uh, which is just essentially saying uh, the, the rules around it are just saying before you order uh, some sort of radiology scan, you know, is it appropriate, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, have you checked all those guidelines? And so what you can do is as a clinician working in your uh, EMR, you say, I'm going to order this, and it can go take you to a workflow that says, have you done this? Have you checked all these things? Here is your confirmation code saying that you have checked them and bring you back to where you were ordering it so you can input that confirmation code and continue on. So it's saying there's an event that's happening. I need to do something with it and come back to where I was. And so that's kind of the uh, CDS hooks. Uh, and that is uh, continuing on implementation things, and uh, there's a lot of good work happening there as well. So all this was happening uh, during DSTU2 and STU3, uh, and R4 came along. And around that time, in uh, 2019, uh, people realized that kind of the, the what's left, the actual subscription part, uh, had some holes. And so um, pushed the big red button, said, let's uh, redesign subscriptions. Uh, for R5, which was a great project uh, and uh, still getting minor updates. Uh, and then people said, yes, but we need an R4. So we started in backport IG. Uh, and then Fire, uh, HL7 said we're going to do Fire R4B. And that gave us the option to add some new resources to make that work a lot better. Uh, and so we've been porting that. So a lot of work over a long period of time and some related projects. But... Um, what was that thing in R2 to R4? Uh, that was query-based subscriptions. So a client could just say, here's a query, tell me when the result set changes. Uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, um, but generally speaking, it looked great for clients, had some scaling issues, had use cases that didn't work for, things like that. Um, this is when they said, oh yeah, this needs to be redesigned. So there's a lot of content out here with more detail, or feel free to ask and we can cover more, but suffice to say, it worked great for some use cases and not for others, and that's why uh, it wasn't meeting the 80% rule that Fire tries to uh, address with all the content. So what was the alternative? Uh, Topic-based subscriptions. So in this case, uh, we have a new, we'll get through all these things, but uh, this is more like PubSub, if you're familiar, or things like that, that you create topics, and then servers can advertise topics, and clients can subscribe to those topics. Um, and this is very important because we have a lot of ways of defining topics, but servers can choose which ones they're going to support. Uh, and that's a big thing for, especially when you talk about scale, uh, you need it to be something that the server can implement performantly and scale out. Uh, the idea was to create common topics, so it's very easy for clients to find these things uh, and use them. And then... Um, yeah, servers can optimize them, and this really enables that server-driven workflow that we were talking about before that's more familiar if you're coming from a V2 world. So what does that mean, uh, nuts and bolts? Well, in R5, and we'll start with R5, R4B has the same things but with adjustments based on what was allowed to be changed in the spec, uh, but we added a new subscription topic resource, uh, and that's just defining this conceptual event, uh, patient admission, discharge, transfer, new medication, whatever it is. Um, and it has a lot of the uh, little pieces that you need to go along with it. So what types of filters are allowed? You know, if you're uh, doing patient admission, um, you might say, you know, the standard patient admission says you can filter by patient ID or group membership. So you can say, okay, if, if I have a patient that is this patient, me, because I'm a consumer, 
or if I have this list of patients that I'm uh, managing in a group resource uh, based on insurance groups or categories or whatever, I can filter on those. I can say, just give me the notifications that affect those patients. Um, as opposed to saying, oh, just any random query you want. And the server can optimize for that very well. Um, we'll dive into more detail here in a little bit too. But uh, we also added some more flexibility to subscriptions. So the different filters that you have, we made the channels extensible so you can use different models of communication, uh, different payload options that allow for uh, things like uh, different security models saying if you're putting full resources or IDs or different things like that to uh, make this easier to work with. And then changes to the notifications themselves, new type of bundle and some meta information, things like that. So that was up for R5, for R4B, you know, uh, we like to joke, all the functionality, half the weight. Uh, really what this comes down to is saying, if you want to use the R5 model, the topic-based subscriptions, and you wanna do them in an R4 type system, uh, here's how you can do it. So, in R4B, we could add the new resources that we wanted, subscription topic and subscription status. Uh, we could not make any changes to the subscription resource itself. So we have a bunch of extensions defined. Uh, and then we could not add the new bundle type. So we're using history bundle uh, and things like that. And these recent edi additions are just, uh, if you haven't been uh, following too closely, but kind of aware of it. Uh, event triggers and then shapes so that we have related resources and things like that. Those have all been added somewhat recently. Uh, so again here, overview parts of subscription. Uh, we've been talking about this here. We have a topic, uh, which is kind of the uh, definitional object. We have the subscription, which is creating the instance to link that topic to a client. Uh, and that's setting up the filters and things like that. And then we have the notifications, which are what the subscription actually sends to that endpoint, that client. Uh, and then there's links here. That's what I was saying, that it's probably easier to just look at the deck. But all of the uh, resources and things like that, we have links here to them in R4B and R5. So what is a subscription topic? Uh, as we said, it's definitional, so it's canonical uh, now in R5. In R4, it's uh, still not uh, listed that because that didn't exist, but that's the type of resource it is. It's uh, something that we want to put in the fire registry. It's not something specific to a patient or a facility or anything like that. It's just a definition that we're going to use. Uh, we've established uh, initial guidelines on how to define them, derive them, reference them. Oops, apologize. Uh, do all those things so that we can kind of build up this ecosystem. And the idea being that we can leave these in the fire registry so people can search for them, find them, and use them that way. Uh, at the end of the day, its job is to describe what causes a notification. So again, we were giving examples earlier about uh, a patient admission. Uh, so we would have some sort of human readable text describing this that tells people both the server implementer and the client implementer or the client user what that is. Uh, it might be defined by a resource state change. So we could say things like uh, this is the uh, looking at the encounter um, resource and it goes into the in progress state uh, whether it's created new or changed from another state to that state. Uh, that will qualify as an admission. Uh, it could be a fire interaction. That's where we're saying like any time an encounter is created, if that's your workflow, uh, that's there. Uh, or even an external event. So if you want to, you can say things like, well, we have a very well-defined uh, HL7 V2 catalog, and this is HL7 V2 um, ADT AO3, AO1. I don't remember off the top of my head, um, but um, use that definition. And that's just to indicate to everyone what you're triggering. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it also defines the allowed filters. So these are the things that you're going to let clients filter based on. So patient ID, patient group membership, uh, maybe you have specific use cases where you want to expose age ranges or things like that. 
um, whatever that is that goes in the topic so that everyone who's implementing it knows what options are available. Uh, and this also prevents arbitrary multi-level chaining. Uh, and this was one of the big issues uh, that you start saying, you know, I want to include, I want uh, admission notifications for patients who have received uh, a specific medication for this particular diagnosis uh, between this date and this date. And you can see, you can build up this very complex uh, query. Maybe you want to allow that on your server. Great, you have that optimized, you expose it. Uh, maybe you create a specific search parameter for it or named query, no problem. Uh, but it's not saying anyone who wants to expose admission events needs to support that. Um, it also defines the shape. So this is uh, additional resources that may be included. Uh, so again, in patient admission, admission or discharge is a little more interesting. Uh, you'd say, yes, it's encounter-based, but we also want the patient. We want any observations. We want any conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I do want to highlight this is may be included, uh, and there's really no way to guarantee this. Um, an encounter may or may not actually have observations. If there aren't any observations made, you would not uh, obviously be able to include them. Uh, there can be security concerns, uh, privacy concerns, all kinds of things. And so this is just kind of a guideline to say, as a server, here's what you should be including, and as a client, here's what you should be expecting. Uh, but everyone needs to handle all kinds of cases around that that it doesn't cover. So examples, again, to make it concrete, uh, one we've been talking about a lot already is patient admission. Um, it's just going through the same things we've talked about. Uh, another example would be an explanation of benefit, EOB resource, uh, insurance related, payment related. Uh, and you can just say, you know, anytime one of these is created, um, I might want to filter on patient ID and group membership, just like I did for uh, kind of the consumer version. Uh, but I also might want to filter on facility, provider, payee, you know, different things like that to uh, give more flexibility in some of my B2B applications, things like that. And then, you know, various other uh, resources you may want to include. So uh, looking again, focusing in and looking at what the resource actually looks like. Uh, when we're talking about the resource trigger, we're saying, oh, we want to trigger based on the encounter resource. We have some sort of description that is uh, human consumable text. Uh, in this case, we're using both, we have a, both a fire path uh, definition and a query based definition. Um, they're representing the same thing. Here you can see previous, previous and current are uh, defined in the spec. So we're saying the previous status was not in progress, the current status is in progress. Or in query, the previous was not in progress, the current is in progress. We require both to be true, but if the previous didn't exist, make it pass. So there's a lot of uh, little details that get into when you start defining these. Uh, the beauty is, the idea is that uh, since there can be a catalog of them, these kind of build up over time and then they're just usable and no one, you don't have to worry about figuring out all these uh, little minutia for the definitions just because you want to implement patient uh, clinical encounters. Uh, same thing, um, this is looking at an event trigger for the same thing, uh, same description, but now, oh yeah, it is AO1. Uh, I always get AO1, AO3 mixed up. Oh, <laughs> nowadays, I don't use them as often. So we're just saying, look at V2, uh, AO1. Um, same thing here, we're looking at the filters that are allowed. And so, again, we have a description. So we're saying, explaining what the filters are. In this case, the filter parameters are, uh, it's only on patient, and we're allowing an inequality or an in for group membership. Same thing, shape. We're saying if we're keying off the encounter, we're going to also potentially be including the encounter patients, the encounter practitioner, the encounter service provider, account location, things like that. And you can see these are just includes. Uh, we support includes and reverse includes. Um, the idea being that uh, pretty much everyone has implemented, whether you're a client or a server, uh, some sort of syntax for include and rev include because they're so common. So that was kind of the uh, straightforward way to get those 
added into topics. So now that we have a topic, we need a subscription. So this is a domain resource, or just a regular resource representing something. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, it's just a way to link a topic to a client. So we need things like the endpoint information. So we need to know, you know, are you getting these via REST? Are you getting these via WebSockets? Uh, what's the URL I'm sending notifications to, et cetera? Uh, what mine type, you know, do you want these in X, uh, Fire XML, Fire JSON, something else entirely? Uh, what kind of payload do you want? Do you want the full resources, ID only, things like that? And then what are the actual filters? So instead of saying you can filter based on patient, uh, this is saying, give me patient one, two, three. Um, so the channel types. Uh, this we were talking about, it's just the method of communication. Um, just kind of uh, whatever words we could think of to try and describe this succinctly. Um, the first thing we did is we predefined channels. So I mentioned earlier, Fire uh, tries to do this 80% rule in that uh, we the specification should define things that cover 80% of use cases. So predefined are things like REST hooks, web sockets, email, and fire messaging. Um, REST hooks are the most, really the most common, uh, and these are just saying you have an HTTP, hopefully S, yes, endpoint, uh, and we're going to send notifications to it. Uh, that might be a web server that's translating these into push notifications for a cell phone. Uh, it might be handling them and doing some other operation, relaying it, translating it into a specific protocol for something else. Uh, but it's pretty common to just have a web gateway and do that so that every server doesn't have to implement everything. So that covers a lot of use cases by itself. Uh, the next one here is WebSockets. Uh, and this is very common for devices that can't stand up web servers. So for instance, your uh, sitting uh, on a computer, you're a uh, personnel in a hospital, uh, and you are just at your desk. Um, your app that's connecting to your EHR isn't necessarily going to be able to stand up a web server and communicate back and all those things. So you say, okay, well, I can just make a WebSocket connection into the server and do it that way. Same thing with a cell phone. Uh, as I mentioned before, you could have a web server that's translating these to push notifications and all these other things. Uh, but if you don't have that, you can still say, well, as a client, I can just connect to the server and get my notifications. Uh, email is one uh, a lot of people kind of uh, look at funny at first, uh, but it's actually very common for some public health uh, type use cases. Um, there are a lot of, especially when you start getting down into county reporting uh, of public health and things like that, they don't necessarily have their own web, sock or web host. They might not even have a domain of their own, things like that, but anyone can get an email address. So if uh, you need to send saying there's a new case of a particular uh, monitored uh, ailment, uh, you can say just send an email to the public health official saying that an event has occurred and they need to get in contact with the facility. And fire messaging, uh, if you're using fire messaging, you'll want to know it's supported. Uh, if you're not using fire messaging, don't worry about it. It's uh, essentially a, a way of breaking up fire outside of the REST protocol. We know that this isn't going to cover everything, though. So we did leave it extensible. You can define your own channel types. Uh, so in this case, uh, for instance, uh, some of the suggestions are things like message queues. Uh, if you have a specific type of message queue you're using, define a channel for it, and that's it. Uh, as a test, we did Zulip, uh, which HL7 Fire Community uh, used extensively for text communication. Uh, and we can send notifications there from the reference implementation so that you can test it out and see what they look like. Uh, and you can do whatever else, even fax. Uh, and we joke about this because uh, someone is implementing a fax gateway for this uh, due to requirements. So what do you actually send? Uh, and this is where we were talking about the payload types. And we kind of defined three categories of this, uh, empty, ID only, and full resource. Uh, and you can see it's just uh, you know least information and a client's gonna have to query. Right? If you just send something happened, client doesn't know what happened, they have to query your server. So it's really just a way of poking the client to say, 
hey, now is when you run your query. Going back to our initial, you know, instead of asking, is there something new, is there something new, is there something new, uh, you say, just wait till I tell you, and then you can ask the question. Uh, the next level up is ID only. So in this case, the notification actually has the identifiers to these resources. So, you know, it'll say it's encounter, uh, you know, 2022, uh, 110, whatever. And uh, it's patient 1234, and uh, it's at uh, facility ABC. So now instead of the, qu the client querying, they just say, give me this information, just fetch uh, or get. Or you can dump, go all the way to full resource, in which case then you say, here are the resources. And uh, generally speaking, then a client won't have to ask for information again. Uh, translating this uh, the other direction here, so you can kind of see the comparison, you know, in the ping, there's three steps, you know, the notification, it just has the subscription, the, the client is querying the server and the client's re retrieving the data. In ID only, the client just has to retrieve it and in full resource, the client doesn't even have to do that. Um, oops, just before I move on, uh, and one of the big reasons here is to consider security. And this is just balancing, as always, uh, performance, security, convenience, all these different things that kind of uh, weigh on everyone as they're architecting systems. Um, if you are, for instance, pushing notifications to cell phones that are going through some sort of non-covered entity as a relay, you don't necessarily want to have PHI in there. Uh, at the same time, you might want to do more than just letting the client query, uh, and that's where ID only is. So kind of have the uh, most extra work, uh, well, I guess it's a, the most that way, uh, but the most extra work with pinging, uh, but it has very little security concern, uh, then full resource is the easiest to implement, but has the most security concern, and ID only is kind of the, the middle road between them. So in practice, as we continue looking at patient admi ad, uh, admission, uh, you can see this is like a consumer case. Uh, we can do a REST hook that's going to a URL to relay it into a push notification for my phone. The patient filter is just a single patient ID. We do ID only to limit the uh, PHI, protected health information, and we do it in FireJSON. Uh, to look at a different example, you can say, for instance, I have a system and I want to know when a medication is dispensed for a practitioner in my facility. Uh, the client will connect via WebSockets. I want to filter on location. I have this distributed by ward, floor, building, whatever. Um, since it's all internal, I can just do full resource. And again, fire JSON because I prefer fire JSON. So uh, again, here, this is just going through the same type of thing, but actually filling out the different elements in the fire resource. Uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time. Again, the deck is available, uh, but it's the same thing we just discussed, that we're doing patient one, two, three. We have an endpoint for rest hooks. We have our content type and our content specification, um, and that's it. So what do you actually get when you do all this? Well, you get a bundle. Uh, in Fire, the way you do a collection is by putting it into a resource called a bundle. In R5, we have this type called subscription notification. Uh, it's very clear what it gives you, and uh, we can customize the rules uh, to make it uh, work the, uh, most optimally. Uh, however, in R4, we couldn't add that because this all happened after R4 was published, uh, and the closest fit we could find is a history bundle. So that's... Uh, all this is described in the implementation guide. Uh, but the big thing is there's a subscription status resource in both of these cases, and it must be at entry zero. So this is the same thing if you have looked at uh, fire messaging or some of these other things. Uh, in the bundle, the first entry is the kind of header information, and that's what this is too. Uh, the subscription status has meta information about the, uh, we'll get to it here in a second, but about the notification itself, about the subscription, uh, all that kind of stuff. And so that has to be the first thing that's in the bundle. Uh, and then it'll have payload. 
So it may include additional resources, it may have IDs, whatever was configured uh, when you created the subscription. So uh, again, I promised you links and links you shall have. So um, there's a reference implementation available. Uh, it's on subscription, subscriptions.argo.run. There's uh, links here. Uh, but there's documentation, there's the UI, there you go, subscriptions.argo.run. Uh, so it has both client's implementation and server implementation in R4 and R5. And all of the uh, code is on GitHub, it's all open source. Uh, and then we stand up on Azure, thank you Microsoft, um, hosted instances so you can just use them real time. Um, if you are just learning about everything, you can use the UI against the server and learn and look and see what all these pieces look like. And we'll have a video going through that here in a moment. Um, but uh, if you are doing one side or the other, you can also use them independently. So there's the server endpoints if you're developing a client and there's the client UI that you can point to your own server. Um, I will note that all of the fire operations in the UI, so it's a React app uh, TypeScript, but it's all happening client side. So you can bring up the UI from subscriptions Argo run and point it at localhost and it'll still interact with your fire server. Um, obviously uh, questions are hard on pre-recorded content, uh, but uh, this link is actually the old link. Let me fix that real time. That's what uh, we get sometimes. Uh, I apologize for that, but I'd rather fix this here. But these are now Fire subscriptions. It is no longer 2021, and so I decided stop putting the year. Uh, so we will continue the slideshow. Here we go. So this deck and others can be found at aka.ms slash fire subscriptions. Uh, on Zulip, there's the subscription stream. Uh, during the Connectathon, we have uh, an additional thread just for connectathon things, um, but we don't have to worry about it. Oops, we don't have to worry about that here. Um, the subscriptions backport implementation guide is available. That's the CI build. It's not officially published yet because we're waiting on R4B publish publication. Uh, here are links to all the resources again, the re reference implementation, the 2021 um, Argonaut uh, project, that uh, did a lot of work recently, and then the Connectathon playlist with this video and others. So thanks again. See, I caught that one. Uh, thanks again. Uh, hope to see you soon here at the Connectathon. Uh, we'll be uh, hanging out all day Tuesday and Wednesday uh, in Zoom. We have a bunch of scheduled sessions and uh, a lot of open time for questions and everything else. Uh, so thank you, and uh, hope to see you soon. Cheers.